Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Many of us listening are obsessed with nature. We work to protect it, plant trees, clean rivers, recycle plastic bottles, participate in beach cleanups, and so on and so forth. We travel to nature, escape to nature, and daydream about being in nature when we're stuck indoors. Many of us, however, don't live in a natural environment. We were either raised in or moved to an urban center and enjoy the comforts of city living, like, I mean, come on, we all do, including getting takeout, Uber rides to bars, movie nights, and being five miles away from everything you need to live a comfortable life. Which leads me to ask, when was the last time you stopped and searched for the wildlife in your city? Do you know the best places to spot raptors, fox, or quote-unquote pesky animals that dig through our trash? When was the last time we celebrated the marvelous ways that nature has adapted to our concrete way of life? Well, today's guest did that and so much more in his docuseries called Edge of Frame. Andrew Budziak is a Canadian wildlife photographer and filmmaker and specializes in urban wildlife. His recently released six-part docuseries visits multiple urban centers across Canada, showcasing both the pleasures of visiting cultural hubs and the wildlife that call them home. I sat down with Andrew to discuss how wildlife photography and filmmaking entered his life after receiving training in journalism, of all things, how he decides which projects to take on, when he became obsessed with urban wildlife, how the idea for Edge of Frame came to be, how he balances his workload with being a father and husband, and what he hopes to see in the future to protect the wildlife that has learned to live with us. Before we dive in, I want to give a special shout out to Katie3388, who left a five-star review on the show on Apple Podcast and said, quote, Brooke is a phenomenal storyteller and even better scientist, asking all the questions we have to the boots on the ground conservation heroes in the field. She is a delight to listen to, and her guests are all incredible people, totally agree, Katie, working to save animals for future generations. This podcast makes me laugh and cry and re-inspires me every time as to why conservation is an important field. Thanks, Brooke. Can't wait to listen to the next episode. Oh, thank you so much, Katie. I really hope you enjoy this episode. It was so much fun to record and I chat with Andrew almost daily now. And I think you might be able to tell with how candid we are, especially towards the end of our conversation. Uh, All right, everyone, please enjoy this episode. Fantastic conversation with Andrew. Exactly, exactly. So... We shall see what comes out of this episode. But Woo! speaking of that, Andrew, I already hit the record button, so we are rolling. Fantastic. And yeah. Thanks again for sitting down with me. I've had so much fun chatting with you ever since we connected about all kinds of stuff. And to catch everyone up and bring everyone up to speed on what I've learned about you when as we started talking as, you know, just friends and getting to know each other, I want to know where did this all start? Did wildlife before come? I mean, did did your love of wildlife come before cameras or did cameras and then your love of wildlife? How did that shake out in your just passion and love of what you do? They were both there, but they were on their own. Like they didn't, they didn't come together for, for a long time. I have grown, I grew up and have lived most of my life in and around Toronto North of the city, we have just spectacular wilderness. Like you don't have to go far until you can see wolves and bears and moose and and, and all sorts of just incredible things. And I was lucky enough, like growing up, my family and I would usually spend like a week up north somewhere and then, you know, maybe a little bit longer if we could. But that's what I was surrounded by. And I was excited to see that 
every single year. It was like, yeah, it's the summer. The summer means going to the forest and seeing these seeing these things. And I got into I got into photography. I th- I guess maybe kind of kind of young. I was in like grade ten, I think, in high school. In my high school, like, so I'm I'm 37 now, and I feel like I'm like the the like the generation that got to touch the dark room, got to touch film, and then was ushered like right along the digital era, like every step from when it was just these like terrible grainy photos to to what it is now. So I was lucky enough to kind of start early and go through this whole transition, but it really wasn't like to like years and years later till I started wanting to put like animals in front of the camera, which is funny because I grew up like, you know, probably you and all your listeners reading magazines like National Geographic and 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 watching every wildlife series you could on TV. But I never like, oh, I have, a, you know, I have a camera and I know how to take photos and I know where animals are and I see animals. And I never thought to, you know, I never really had the desire to put those two together until, until a bit later. But I'm glad I finally did. Was there a certain inspiration that came that way? Because... I mean, I can see how, and it might be other photographers journey where that that's always a love of theirs, but that's not what they end up doing. Maybe they go into other forms of art or other forms of photography. So was there a particular instance where you're like, actually, I want to use my art, my artistry, my talents to photograph wildlife? I was, um, in my past life, I was, uh, I was a I was a news reporter and producer, and I went out to to Winnipeg in, in Central Canada to to be a reporter for a summer. And the wildlife out there is is phenomenal. I have in laws out there and spend a lot of time with them, and a lot of time out in in nature. And I just I had my camera with me, and I just started kind of taking photos of wildlife. And it was just it was a thing. Like sometimes I take would take photos of food. Sometimes I would take photos of you know, people, friends, and hey, why not animals too? And that I that taught me how to do it. I, I learned how to do it, kind of the simple, the simple, simple tricks there. And then I just started doing it more and more and more. And eventually I stopped caring about pretty much anything else. I just wanted to photograph wildlife. I'm like this is this is fantastic. Like like why haven't I been doing this forever? And what was great was I had done a lot of editorial photography. So like uh journalism kind of that that sort of that sort of documentary style and I was able to apply a lot of those elements to the wildlife photography that I was doing so you know a, a close-up photo of of a you know a deer with these big big beautiful eyes that wasn't enough for me I wanted I wanted the bigger story I wanted to see the scenery I wanted to know the location I wanted to know what was happening I, I wanted to to treat it like each image like a story and that has served me so well through throughout all of this because I've been able to, I think, challenge what's expected of, of a wildlife photographer, perhaps. And I always like you know, just doing things a little bit differently, whether it's to challenge myself or just to be annoying. So to be able to sort of sit, sit back and like, just be like, hey, you know, like I've seen a photo of a wolf. Like I've, we all know what a wolf looks like, but how do I, how do I like capture a really unique image of a wolf? That's my style, that, that, that people haven't really seen before. Maybe I'm getting ahead of our chat here, but that was one of the huge draws for me when I started doing urban wildlife photography is that nobody was doing it. It didn't look like anyone else's work. And that got me excited. It was like, oh, I could do I could do this different thing. I could sort of have my signature on this without actually having my signature on this. This is just this is just the style. So I think Going back to your question, like, you know, was there a moment? It was, it was definitely, it was definitely gradual, but you know, and then there was just kind of one day it was like, oh man, I'm addicted. This is, this is what I do. <laughs> this is, this is all I want to do. I'm, I'm so far into this now, you know, how did all of my, my lenses get, get so long? Um, and, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I, I don't have that moment where it's like, oh, aha, uh-huh, like, you know, now I'm a wildlife photographer. It just, it was gradual, a slow burn. And now it's where we are. I feel like it happens to most of us. Mm-hmm. So was your background then in journalism? Is that what you did before? My background, yeah. So my background, I would I would say for, for this context, is journalism. I went to, did a journalism program, came out of that, uh, worked for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, 
was in a bureau in, in England. They're the London Bureau, which was fantastic. That sort of considered, the, they treat that as the Europe Bureau. Uh, I was back in Toronto producing TV and radio. And then, like I said, went to Winnipeg to be a reporter and did, did all of that. Like just learned it and learned how a newsroom works and how to operate in a newsroom and heard it, how to turn around stories really quickly. And one of the, the best skills that served me so well is how to write for The Voice. While I'm hosting my series, whether I'm saying stuff on camera or reading a VO, it's a real challenge to learn how to script something and make it sound like we're talking. I can listen to podcasts. I can listen to radio. I know when someone's reading and I know when someone's just saying stuff. Except for like the top tier, like the really, 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 really good, good, good people. You can't tell because they're so good at writing or having somebody write for their voice. And that has just served me so well. And it's actually been great because I've helped a lot of like researchers and scientists with this as well in their work where, you know, they're like, you know, we just keep chatting or whatever. And they're like, oh yeah, my lectures feel a little stiff. And I'm like, yeah, because you're reading an essay. And I think for, for science and for communication, like the communication part, like has to be there and it has to be big. And it's, it's, you know, as important as the content of what you're saying is knowing how to say it and convey that is, is massive. And I think you're doing your audience, the public, whoever, a disservice when you're, to put it bluntly, you're boring. And reading an essay out loud is boring. And writing for your voice is not boring. That's interesting. That's that's fun. But it's also really hard. And, and a newsroom taught me how to, how to do that. Active, short sentences. Hear your tempo, hear your cadence, hear your, hear your voice, what you have to say. So for all the things that journalism in my time in a newsroom taught me or, or being a reporter or being on radio or whatever that how to speak and how to engage was was something and i mean i still really work on that and i'm nowhere near where i want to be but i feel like that at least set me on the track to to thinking about it oh cool i did not expect this rabbit hole but i'm diving down <laughs> so i would like to explore this a little bit more then so a lot of people listening we are all somehow in some form of communication of conservation, whether it is in a formal setting or whether it is just at dinner table or it's, you know, it's summertime now. So all the cook, 4th of July cookouts and stuff that's going to be coming up. So is there like some main tips or main takeaways or maybe like some way we should view when we are starting to put together our own voice and our own way that we want to talk about whatever it is, the message that we have? Are there like some big tips that you can think of that maybe we could at least try to start employing in that when, way? When you're talking, when you're having fun, when it's it's the long weekend and you're in the backyard barbecuing, whatever you're having, and you know, your beer flowing out of the coolers and people are like, oh, <laughs> hey, you just came back from Tanzania. You just came back from the Arctic, what, whatever. Hey, you know, your lab, I know you're, you're working on this, or maybe they don't see it that enthusiastically, but they're like, hey, what are you, <laughs> what are you up to? And- when you start telling these things, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're just, whether you're, you're, you're doing field research or lab research or whether you're a scientist or, or you're, you're a photographer or you're doing, doing anything in this field that, that deals with wildlife or nature or science, if you can't summarize what you're doing in like a really short sentence, you need, you need to spend some time thinking about what you do. We get so in our heads and so bogged down, it's like, what are you doing? Well, well, there's this thing, right? And and it's awesome. And it's it's like this and this and this and this and this. And you're all over the place. And it's like, not that you have to speak in this way, but I think in your in your mind, whether you're at the barbecue or during an interview or in a pod, podcast, just have that sentence. Here's what it is. Here's what I do. And one of the things I, I love to tell people is even though you're not talking to a six-year-old, pretend you're talking to a six-year-old. Because your knowledge of these subjects is so deep that even if you think you're kind of dumbing it down, you're just going to see their eyes like glaze over. And <laughs> yeah. you're gonna, it's going to happen. They're like, oh, my. and you could feel it. You're panicking. You're trying to get out of it and make it more interesting. It's like, dumb it down because your knowledge of this is like so vast. And even if it's something really tangible, like like coloring lions, like something you could kind of explain or or whatever, counting polar bears or any of these things. We have this, I don't know what it is, just this weird human nature. And it's it's so true, I think, in 
in the sciences and and wildlife. It's like to sound smart. It's like we don't mm, don't sound mm-hmm. don't sound smart. Don't like just it doesn't <laughs> it, 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 like you're you're just you're 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 turning people's brains off. They feel like they're being spoken to and like lectured to. And and that would be my big thing. It's like you don't need to sound smart. And I I spent a lot of time interviewing people, whether it's for my series or for documentaries. And I mean, it's always the best just talking to someone who's never been on camera before, because once they get over those initial nerves, they're the best. The worst people to interview are academics. <laughs> and, he, and he was like, come on, man. And I'll say it. I'll be like, again, again, give me that again. Like why? Like that word was like 65 syllables. Get out of here with that. Like break it down. Like you're not, you're not giving a like, come on, like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like dumb it down, dumb it down, dumb it down. And you know, I, I love nothing more than picking up a, you know, a scientific article and reading the abstract. And it's like really fun and concise. And within the first three lines, I'm like, oh, I, I know what this is all about. Now I just got to pull the details. That doesn't often happen. All, some, some abstracts are really long. And you'll finish it. And you're like, what? It, well, what? Like, <laughs> what? And now like, and I can go back and read that again in a conversation, like, you know, that gets lost. So, and here I am just speaking about communication and, and rambling on and on, but I think that's, that's all to say, just keep it interesting for the love of God. Like we're doing important work here. The last thing you want to do is, is lose people over July 4th barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've definitely learned that exact same lesson because even my parents they they you know i have three sisters and so everyone's like oh what do your girls do and my mom like my parents have very easy answers for all of them but me and they're like i don't actually know what she does so um this is my guess and we'll go from there (laughs) so i completely understand like having a concise way and yeah over the years like my elevator pitch i I it's essentially what it is like what do you do like what is the podcast about what do you do for professionally yeah the more simple you keep it the better and if somebody is actually interesting and learning more they'll ask questions but if they're not then you're then you're just just move on and you don't even have to waste your breath because those people you're not going if that first thing that you tell them isn't going to like pique their interest at all then maybe just make a good friend about something else (laughs) you know what I mean hundred percent hundred percent yeah. So, okay. So we are in a newsroom and you are becoming a professional at how to essentially write a story. Mm-hmm. So I'm seeing all of these details come together. Okay. So you're getting really good at a camera. You're getting really good at editorial stuff. So how did you make the leap to wildlife filmmaking itself and starting to make documentaries on your own? I, just being in this field, I know that's not an easy thing to do. So how'd you get from one to the other? I had a breakdown's the wrong word, but I just became so disheartened with what I was doing because I had this maybe naively romantic image of lots of travel and going around the world and and telling stories that way. And the way that larger news organizations are shaped now, it's that that's just not that's not happening. You know, like we can't all be Anderson Cooper being being sent all over the place. So I was just like, like what am I what am I doing? Like I just I don't you know, I kind of was enjoying it, but not really. So this this opportunity came along to go work for for an NGO that did disaster response, like nothing to do with wildlife. But I'd be doing the storytelling I love, and I'd be traveling. So I went and I did that for for two years, and it was it was awesome. It was super hardcore. Uh, we were a small shop. You know, wake up, come in the day, whatever. You're checking your emails. The boss calls, like, hey, you know, you see that earthquake in Pakistan? It's like, yep. It's like you're on a plane in like four hours. I hope you like did your laundry last night. So it was like, oh, I was like, all right. Like that's, you know, we'd go and, and, and do that. So I did that for about two years, which was, which I loved. And then you, you can't do that sort of thing for, for, for too, too long. So after that, I, I left and started my own small production company. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to do the storytelling I've wanted to do. I have, I feel like I have the chops. I've done the travel. I know a bit about the world and how to get around to places. Like, let's do this. And I started and did a little of this, a little of that. And um, just through this really weird kind of free coincidence, I was, I was chatting with a friend in, our, in my backyard and we were having, just having beers. I said, hey, I have this idea where we travel around the province and like tell these environmental stories that I think would be really cool that like people are covering. And the next day called me back. He's like, I had a meeting. I got us a bunch of money. Let's go see polar bears. 
And I, went, oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that easy. Eh? That, um, <laughs> Just see that coming. <laughs> I was like, oh, and of course, it's never, ever, ever, ever happened like that before, right? It's, it, or, or since, sorry, I should say, like, it just doesn't happen. So we, we got our budgets sorted out and went to Polar Bear Provincial Park on, which is like the very top of Ontario, right in, in Georgia Bay, like the southern part of Hudson, uh, sorry, southern part of Hudson Bay. And uh, everybody knows Churchill. This is actually um, that same sort of population, but a little bit like similar to that population, but a bit further south. Mm-hmm. It's the southern, like these are like the southern most polar bears in the world. And unlike Churchill, this is completely unsupported. So there's there's a Cree community um, called Piwanek just a bit south of there. And um, we met up with someone who's now like a really good friend of mine, Sammy Hunter, who's like this, just this awesome polar bear guide. And the three of us, went on the tundra and like the very, very Southern tundra and like made documentaries about polar bears. And we had, for my end, like I had traveled before, but I wasn't ready for this. It was completely mm. unsupported and, you know, definitely on the riskier side of things. And it was, you know, we're sleeping in like a wooden little wooden shed and, you know, Sammy's the best guy in the world. I felt completely safe, but still my, my full mattress had a, had a polar bear, like bite mark in it um oh and and the walls the walls of this shed where we were in it was just plywood on top of plywood because when the polar bears get bored they like jump through these sheds and see what's inside so we were inside and luckily nobody paid us a visit but we got great footage and like did the storytelling and after that i was like yeah this is all i want to do like i don't i don't want to do mm, anything else you're hooked like, I'm, I'm hooked like this is and, and it, it wasn't i should say like as as cool as it was seeing these polar bears and like we were they were like right there which was remarkable we saw some incredible behavior that was kind of new to science at the time this this transitioning diet these long, longer periods of eating seaweed because the ice wasn't forming as fast and, and all this stuff like that we couldn't even fit into the, the, the storytelling you're kind kind of doing as cool as that all was meeting sammy and hearing his story and his relationship with the animals and what he's done kind of devoting his life to protecting these bears and, and getting the word out and being this incredible guide. I'm like, yeah, like this is my beat. Like this is everything mm-hmm. I've loved about wildlife plus the journalism sort of put together and, and everything I've done since I would say I, it, it's the story I'm going to It's like on this line that exists between let's say us and, and the wild world. And that's, and that's what's interesting to me. It's like one, one foot to the left, one foot to the right, where it's like where all that comes, comes together. And it's, it's us and wildlife for better, for worse. And that's the kind of storytelling that, that I, I guess, sort of stumbled upon up there in, in Polar Bear Provincial Park. And that stuck with me ever since. And pretty much every story I've done since has been kind of in that, in that spirit. So then how do you decide topics as somebody who does a weekly podcast and has talked with a lot of people around the world on all seven continents? How do you decide on a topic and who to focus on and where to like spend all of your resources? That that has to be, I can't, I don't, I guess, what is your process? How do you go about that? I I have a lot of lists. I have a lot of stories written (laughs) down, like just like Google Docs. And notebooks and just like ideas and um, I'll read an article. There'll be a little paragraph. And I'll be like, "Oh, that like I gotta I gotta make note of that." So it's just like tons of potential things. Or I'll be reading a book or I'll be listening to a podcast. And all of those things, I'll just kind of like squish together somewhere and have a list. And I just I just think about them. And when something kind of clicks, it's like, "Yep, yeah, here's a story. Here's what I do. Here's here's how I want to tell it." And I'm lucky enough that I have worked in like I've done this sort of storytelling with with not just video or photo, but print and um, audio storytelling too, like radio mm. docs. So, you know, think about this story. What's the best way to tell this story? Is this a story I should be telling? Is this a story I can't tell? Is this a story I want to tell? And now it's like, I think where I am, I, I would say my thinking is, even if I can, yes, I'm the guy, I can tell this. I have uh, funding set up for this. I have access. I have all of this stuff. No, none of that matters if I can't make it like next level. Mm. So it's, that sounds a little, maybe a little rich, but 
It's like there are so many stories out there. It's like who 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 cares? You know, right, I want right. I want it to be like this is this is special. Like this is a good a good story. So my output is I think maybe shrinking a little bit, but I think the quality is going up, and I I want people to like remember these stories that I've I've done, or like they kind of they stand out, or or what's what's the point? We're so flooded with like conservation related content, and I I don't know how much of it is is memorable, and I don't think we can. I think one of the worst things you could do to justify doing a story is saying it's important. I think the second you've said that, you're kind of lost, right? And it's no, no, we want to do not that, not that the, the issue itself, like, yeah, we should be coloring lines because that's important. We make that, that, but the story, if we're going to sink time and resources into telling these stories, saying, well, it's important isn't enough because the audience doesn't want to be fed vegetables, they don't care. Right. They, 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 it's like, no, no, this is okay. It can be an important story, but this story has to be awesome and worth telling and like absorbing. I've certainly made things that aren't good. I thought they were important. I thought they were good at the time, but sit back and watch. I'm like, why did I do that? And, and to me, one of the best responses is when people are like, oh, I didn't expect that. Mm. And I love that. Like, I, I, I love that. There's, there's nothing worse than people just kind of like applauding after and be like, yeah, like good job. Like, cool. You, you want you want to elicit a better response in that, whether it's like tear or anger or joy or surprise or ecstasy or whatever, and that's how we we drive these issues. If you if you want to do you know impact driven storytelling, you have to elicit some sort of response. It can't just be a impact report visualized. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think that's a big detriment. Like don't do that. Like just find find that story and how can we make this like truly spectacular and all the best things, you know, all the best video or articles you've, you've read, I think have, have done that. The ones you remember, man, there's like a big pool of stuff out there. And I think you have to work so hard to separate yourself from that. If you want to, if you want to be doing this for, for more than a year or two. I agree. And I experienced that firsthand last year. I was honored to be a preliminary judge for Jackson Wild. And I was in which category? I think ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so since you're the preliminary level, you watch the whole gamut of Mm -hmm. stuff from BBC all the way to somebody, they made something in their backyard. And not that there was anything wrong with somebody making something in the backyard. That's not what I meant. It was just the depth of storytelling quality and the, the films that moved me the most Whoa, I was moved. I <laughs> was moved beyond. I still remember my I the top two, my top two, they actually won multiple awards mm-hmm. last year in the in the entire um film festival just series. Both mm-hmm. of them won many, many awards. <laughs> and they did tell the best story. Like, and yeah. it's it's incredible. And I what I loved about them as well is I do appreciate stories that just focus on wildlife, just because I one sometimes want to escape but they had strong people focuses too in a very hope and inspirational manner. And so I found that so refreshing and beautiful. And I just love to see where conservation media is going. It's not just all doom and gloom and fear and all this kind of stuff. And I think that that is a perfect segue to your most recent project. And so let's hone in on what you did recently. And you kind of brought it up a little bit and gave (laughs) a little bit of a hint, but I don't want to completely spoil it. So Maybe could you give me and everyone listening, how did the idea for with your current docuseries that you just released, how did it come to be? And why did you decide that this is what you should spend a significant amount of time on doing and then promoting and putting together and all that kind of stuff? So maybe give us the history and what you did and why you did it. <laughs> sure. So a couple of months ago, I released a six episode series called Edge of Frame. And this has been that was a lot of not just prep in terms of like physical work and writing and emails, all that stuff, but a lot of prep for my end on thinking on on what I want this to be. I have spent the last several years becoming an urban wildlife storyteller. That's like 90% of what I do. And that's through photo and video and 
that started during the pandemic once I moved to this area of the city that was really close to the Don Valley, which is this incredible like stretch of green that we have in, in Toronto. And I just started posting them like, hey, like these are the animals in our city. Like, hey, deer, raccoon, foxes, whatever. And people really, like really reacted so strongly to that. They're like, we have what in our city? And I, I like, there were articles written about what I was, what I was doing. And, and sometimes the articles, you know, could be something like, hey, like, like you've seen deer? I'm like, yeah. Like with antlers? I'm like, Yeah. Like in the city, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and it would be, you know, like that, that basic of, of a thing. And it just, it took off. And I called my, uh, my, my really good friend, Mark Utley, who was the camera operator on, on so much of, of what I've done over the years. And he's, he's like a camera operator extraordinaire. And he's, he's just so, he's one of the best. And uh, I called him. I was like, hey, man, um, I'm going to go just like do some photography like shoot some stuff of deer and maybe some raccoons and there's an owl that hangs around there. I'm like, you want to come like put a long lens on your camera and do that with me? And he's like, he's a documentary guy. He's not a, he's not a wildlife guy. So I was like, yeah, let's go do this. It's going to be super fun. He's like, no, that's, that sounds boring. <laughs> he's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm like, I don't I'm like animals, like whatever. And I was like, oh, and he's like, but I'd like to get video of you doing that. Like, do your on-camera thing. Let's have some fun. I'm like, all right. So threw a mic on me. We went out for the day, and he just kind of followed me as I was as I was doing this. I was saying stuff to camera. Um, we had a great coyote encounter. We found scat. We saw a deer. Like, we just did this thing, and I took all the footage back from from this great day and just edited it together. And it was this really short, like five minute thing. And I just called it Edge of Frame, and. Uh, it caught on. It did well. Then we just did like a bunch more. I think we did um, like five or six of these little episodes in Toronto. Just, you know, they're just labors of love. And uh, my other friend, Ryan Morgan, came along and he's all like the two of them are are phenomenal. Like they're two of the best camera ops we have in this country. And I'm lucky to, to know them both. And they're like, yeah, let's do this. This is fun. No one's getting paid. Let's have a great time. And like we're killing ourselves laughing doing this because it's it was it was a super fun little thing to do. And sort of caught on and I'm like, let's see what we can do with this. So I applied for some funding, like some legit funding and uh, making a series is expensive. It, it doesn't matter what you're I can doing. Only imagine. It's, it's expensive. So like travel series are expensive. Wildlife series are expensive. So you can imagine how much a travel wildlife series costs. <laughs> so the, the, the pitch was for the series where I would go visit six cities across Canada and it's an urban wildlife adventure photography travel show. That's like, that's what this was. And that, that was the pitch. And I'm still stunned that it got greenlit and we got the, the thumbs up to, to do this. And we started in Vancouver and this was, this was last year. So about a, about a year ago now, we went, uh, <laughs> Vancouver, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Toronto, Montreal, St. John's, Newfoundland. And each city that I visited, I had an assignment to get a photo of X. But along the way, so for instance, like Vancouver, the assignment was getting a photo of a harbor seal. Great, right? You go down, you, you get a photo. Well, they're kind of hard to find. I mean, they're there, but they're hard to find. It's hard to get a good photo. So, you know, along the way, there are restaurant scenes and interviews with awesome local people and scuba diving. And like misadventures and a trip to the Marine Mammal Rescue Center. And it was so fun and at sometimes completely ridiculous and other times just so stupid. And the series ended up looking, uh, I think, pretty damn good. And the stories were, were a blast. And I think the fun we had on the road really shined through in the final product. And I was very, very happy with how everything turned out and it's six six episodes they're all between like i don't know like 12 and 18 minutes and it's just hey like here's the urban wildlife in canada this is what it looks like and wherever you're watching in the world if you're watching in a city i promise you you have off awesome urban wildlife like this too and one of the big mantras that was in the back of my head the whole time was you can't protect what you can't see and that really influenced the the why that I'm doing this, like the why is people don't know what's out there. 
and um, have this really unique opportunity to to show them what's out there. And that's that's what we did through this through the series through Edge of Frame, and it was a dream, like it was an absolute dream to host. It was so fun. I'm so thrilled with with how it ended up, and the reaction has been awesome too. It's so nice to hear from people across the country being like, oh man, I have no idea we had like this in our city or that this was there or that was there. And uh, it was, it was rewarding. And I just, I'm so ready to get back out there and, and do more. And I think my biggest question, just because I also love to go out and find wildlife and everything. Mm -hmm. How did you know what species was going to be the highlight urban wildlife moment for each city? Did you like, were you looking at forums? Did you have a network where you like were pegging people that you knew from Saskatoon? Like what should it, how did you know where to go and what to photograph? So there was there was a lot. I mean that and that just goes back to the to the journalism days. Just do your research. Call, 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 dig, 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 read, 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 try to get your spotty senses up, talk to people. Yeah, one of the big the big things for that was just like calling people that were kind of in this weird realm of like not the academics per se. Um, but somewhere like someone who's out there seeing these things. So photographers are great. Just Instagram, like what are people posting? And some of the people on the show, so like in Saskatoon, Mike Dagoo, the beaver guy, he's this like planet's biggest supporter of urban wildlife. And he's just this guy and he goes out and he's got a little point and shoot and he hangs out with beavers and they know him and he knows them. And he was like the ultimate guy. Like he, he's like... As much as I like to think I'm into urban wildlife, that's his life. And he's awesome. Yes. And she's awesome. And the Saskatoon episode is so fun. And, and Mike is the reason why. And, you know, I had, a, I had a bunch of calls with him. And he's like, come on down. He wasn't even going to be in the show. Like, Mike, like one of the best characters in the show, wasn't even going to be on it. Because I was talking to him. And I was like, yeah, man, come on. I'll show you around. I'll show you where the beavers are. You can get your photos and I'll take off. I'm like, all right. And the second I met this guy, I'm like, we're putting a mic on you. And you're on camera <laughs> with me for like... I'm glad you made that decision. He's awesome. Isn't isn't Mike great? Yes. Yeah. He's like the sweetest guy. So we, yeah. So, you know, people like him or, you know, just different forms. And then also like having kind of your list, but in each city, I wanted that animal, did not, like, I didn't want a random animal. I wanted that animal to like say something about the city and the city to say something about the animal. Like I wanted this, I wanted everything to makes sense i just didn't want to pick like a random pretty animal like there, there has there, there that had to help the narrative like the location inform the animal the animal inform the location all of all of those things and it was like what what can we dig like what's the great story that we can pull out of here and that that was challenging at times because we only had a couple days in each city and like wild wildlife doesn't care animals don't care so yeah, Saskatoon, we were there for three days. Montreal, I think we were there for three or four days. And it, if anyone's done, <laughs> done wildlife photography, you could go four days without seeing anything, right? Easy. And so it was, yeah, it was, it was just kind of this crazy thing. And the final episode in St. John's, we were trying to get whales as they came in. Like we arrived as the whales were supposed to be arriving, but nature doesn't work like that <laughs> yeah. and, and St. John's was like was wild and hard and you know I start the episode and I don't look good like I look tired and gray and my eyes are all sunk and I just I think my, I'm like talking to the camera babe. I want to go home and that was all super real I didn't want to go home we were we were tired and uh, nature doesn't care and luckily literally at like like the the last possible hour things things happened so mm -hmm. that was, uh, that's, that's the fun of making, of making TV. Yeah. No, I won't spoil it either. Cause I did watch <laughs> all the episodes. Um, and speaking of special people that you had, you actually had Ginny on the series and Ginny Wong right. has been on the podcast. And so I had to take a moment. How did you meet Ginny? And she's incredible. She actually judged. It was, it was funny. Um, I, one of my photos, uh, was listed as one of Canadian Geographic photos of the year. Yeah, it was the Canadian Geographic Wildlife uh, Photography of the Year contest um, in two years ago, I think. And she was one of the judges. And after my my photo was was listed and published and all that stuff, she she reached out. She's like, "Hey, I'm one of the judges, and just want to like say I you know, 
people really liked your photo and, and, and here's why. And I'm like, oh, you're awesome. And we've just been in touch since then and have had a lot of communication. We've chatted and been like, we should find a way to like work together. So uh, when I did the Edmonton episode, she came, we had this awesome, we went to this awesome cocktail bar, had a whole bunch of fun. And just chatted photography. And as much as it is a photography show, it's also not a photography show. Oh. There's no camera specs. We're not like nerding out on, oh, I'm using this lens now and this and this and this. Yeah. It's not It's not that at all. It's, it's a lot more fun than that. So when I wanted to sit down with somebody and talk photography, I wanted someone who was going to be fun and like not a photo nerd. And she's just, she's just awesome. So of course she, you know, we sat down, we had great conversation, uh, had a whole bunch of fun. Her cocktail matched her outfit for some reason. Mine matched mine. <laughs> and we just just chatted for like for ages and, and had a really good time. And she fits so well into the episode. And yeah, I'm just so grateful that she yeah, took the time to to hang out for that one. Yeah, gosh. We'll have to reach out to her and be like, Jenny, I'm talking with Andrew and he's gonna be on this show. <laughs> <laughs> We were chatting. Oh, we, were, we were we were chatting. Um, we were, she and I were actually chatting yesterday. She just came back from a wild uh, adventure. So you'll be yeah. Anybody out there should go check out Jenny Wong Jenny Wong's Instagram because she just had some yeah some cool encounters. Yeah, I think it's like J Dub's capture. I think is her yeah. Instagram. Yeah. yeah, she's amazing. I'm gonna go listen to her episode too. Mm -hmm. So I you you've mentioned a little bit of the why, but. Being the conservation biologist that I am, I would like to maybe stick on that a little longer. Is there a particular conservation goal that you had for this series? Or was it more of a, like an awareness thing? Or I guess where does this work fit in the bigger picture when it comes to conservation of wildlife? I think that, I, I don't think I know that conservation thinking around urban wildlife right now is like a hundred years behind what it is for let's say polar bears or chimps or whales or whatever it's most people don't even think about it as a thing like most people aren't like when you say urban wildlife they're like oh yeah like squirrels right <laughs> <laughs> but our our urban, if you want to say, use the phrase urban ecosystem, that's the only one that's growing. Like we're we're destroying all other ecosystems to the benefit of cities and let's say farmland. And even farmland is is being encroached by by urbanization. So the animals that are there are either dying or being forces a real weird world but being absorbed into these these cities so the the conservation aim and i don't even like once again like it almost it almost like i don't even like using that term because it's like i don't even know if we're there yet in, in our thinking or in our, our actions around urban wildlife i just want to show people what's there it's like hey like here are these animals they're they're part of your city they're part of your ecosystem they live in, you know, in your the, the seaside, your your rivers, your lakes, your trees, your backyard, your roof under your your deck in the in the forest and, and wherever they're they're all over here. There are these incredible animals that are there by some miracle of stayed on by some miracle. I mean, some like like coyotes and, and peregrines have been able to thrive in the city and do do very well. And some I feel like are just hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And like I've said, like you, you can't you can't protect what you can't see, and and people aren't seeing these things because their eyes aren't peeled for it. You know, if you're driving through um, a national park, you're like, oh, where where are the bison? Where's where are the bears? Where's the elk? Where's the whatever? But when you're driving through a city, you're just looking at the road. And I've got my head up, but like, where are the raccoons in the trees? Like, trying to keep my eyes on the car ahead of me, I don't want to <laughs> rear end anybody. But you know, I know, I'm like, ah, the raccoon in the tree and. There it is. And oh, yeah, you know, some coyotes in that field over there. And, you know, look at that. And oh, I bet that pond is, you know, home to a bajillion snapping turtles. And it's like, if I could, I want to get people, I want to turn people on to it. I want to, I want to get people addicted to it, like, like I am. And it's not just, it's not just a stop at the animals. Uh, cities are becoming like right now, it's just so expensive to live. 
it's so expensive to be alive. And that's super true in cities and uber true in Toronto. Like Toronto has become so unlivable and everything, I mean, the, the, the housing and rent, it's, it's, it's insane. It's criminal. And one of the last things you can do without having to spend money and have a really good time is go outside. And if we fall in love with these animals and we want to protect them and we want to do better for them, then we're going to def- you know, kind of de facto improve their environments too. And their environments happen to be these places where we can go and walk around and have fun and really enjoy ourselves and like not have to go into debt for a night out or a day out or whatever. Yeah. And like cities just cannot become the playground of the uber rich. Like that's, that's bad. That's bad for you know, 99% of us. And protecting wildlife is like, has this like ripple effect. If you, if you, if, if, if hopefully, hopefully I've helped maybe one or two or a couple people like fall in love with urban wildlife and open their eyes to it a little bit. And by doing so, it's like, oh yeah, let's protect this. Like maybe let's make these things election issues. It's great. We're going to help the animals and we're going to help us. We're going to help the city. We're going to, we're going to make cities greener and make sure our water stay clean and healthy so we could, we could swim and do what we, you know, have a great time in, in the water in our, in our parks. So it's really this like win, 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 win situation by, <laughs> yeah, by just thinking about urban wildlife and, and enjoying it and protecting it. It's, it's good for them and it's, and it's great for us. Mm, yes. Gosh, totally agree with that. And you have, in, in your series, yeah, you also have a lot of fun showing the, also some city highlights as well, which is really fun to see mm-hmm. the balance, like eating a really tasty meal that looked amazing or having a good beer or, <laughs> or any different various things as you're on this adventure to find wildlife. And I have to ask, just because as a fellow traveler that always has like one or two memories that I will never forget, was there a particular moment in a city with a wildlife encounter or experience that just really moved you that was... If you could put a favorite or anything like that from the series. There were so many, and I don't know why, but the Montreal episode, which sort of happened in the middle, really stands out for me as as a highlight in so many regards. I was terrified to do that episode. My goal there was to get a photo of a fox. Foxes are hard to photograph. They're just, they're hard to, fo- like, they're hard to find, it unless there's a den that you're kind of like, you know about, or... There's an area that you're 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 familiar with, and you know the foxes are kind of regularly there. To parachute into a city and find foxes and photograph them, like forget it. That's yeah, that's, I don't know that's, how you that's, did that's it, hard. honestly. <laughs> so that was my goal. I was kind of dreading that episode, and we showed up very very tired. We had a weird flight. This didn't make the episode, but like we lost like uh, the airline Air Canada lost a bunch of our luggage, which was our gear. So we were like half-legged with our gear which is like crazy so yeah also like we didn't have a rental car like like we showed up it was our flight was delayed it was late we didn't have a car we had to do uber half of our luggage was missing and i kind of woke up the next day like oh man we have like three days we got to shoot all this stuff and i got to find foxes and yeah fine i'll spoil it because it's like in it's in the intro of the series but we found foxes I found foxes and not just foxes, like the, the, the moment when we found them and now that it's, it's the, the episodes out and I'm not so worried about this anymore. <laughs> we weren't exactly supposed to be where we were getting those photos. It was like a gray, it was a gray area of like, Oh, can we be shooting here? Can we not? And I normally abide by all the rules. This was a gray area, kind of rolled the dice. And it was like, once again, it was like the 11th hour and this moment kind of revealed itself and we were, (laughs) we were short on gear. We were, we were tired and everything just came together. And it wasn't, it wasn't even that much time with these foxes. And it was, I mean, I think the footage of the photos speak for themselves. Like it was so, so magical. And I just like, I had this moment where I sort of down on the grass shooting at, at the level of these foxes and 
my hands know what to do. My hands know how to take a photo. They're kind of doing it automatically in my brain. Like half my brain was thinking about the photo and composition and all this stuff. And then the other half of my brain sort of went somewhere else for a bit. And it just, I don't know where it went, but I started thinking about like my son and my wife and just, you know, my family at home and, and me and being alive. And it was this really nice moment of connectedness as I watched this, this, this vixen and this kit, like just enjoying the sun um, at the end of the day. And yeah, it, it just kind of reminded me of this beautiful cycle that we're, we're a part of. And it was nice to know that I was alive at the same time as these foxes. And yeah, that, you know, I'm going to die and everyone I love is going to die and we're going to just go into the earth and be part of this cycle again. And that just goes on and on. And yeah, and then my brain kind of went back to my photos and it was like, oh, well, maybe I hope, really, really hope that, you know, one of these photos or one of the photos I get on this trip or something I land in this series can, you know, remind people that, hey, you know, we're, we're a part of all of this. So why not just try to make it better for the people that are here on the next part of the cycle and uh, and, and the animals too. And yeah, it was just this really nice moment that was that was brief, but felt almost eternal when I was when I was doing it and just something with the light and these beautiful foxes and where my mind went, like that's, that's a moment I'll probably remember forever. And I can't watch that episode without, without kind of being brought back to that. Mm, I totally get that. I definitely mm. have one of those moments on my most recent trip mm. and I even like teared up at everything. So I can, fl- there's always at least one where you just mm. get so moved and it'll be forever ingrained in your memory. Mm-hmm. And So, I mean, you're obviously in these cities for multiple days, Mm -hmm. but the episode itself isn't that long. So, are there any scenes that you had to cut out that you could tell me about that? We 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 (laughs) like a destination. (laughs) We could have we could have doubled the length of the episode. We left we left a lot on the floor, like Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. like restaurant scenes, interviews, animal encounters. There is so much that we didn't put in for all sorts of reasons. Some of them, some of the scenes were really, 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 really good. We didn't keep them in. Some of the scenes um, just didn't fit or didn't flow or didn't kind of sit fit in the final episode. So there's tons. There was one, there was a moment that was like such a gamble. And and, and I took it out because it I think it distracted from just how kind of cool the whole scene was. And it just put the brakes on in a weird way. But in the moment, I'm like, I cannot believe this is happening. <laughs> once again, once again in the Montreal episode. We do an urban climbing scene where we there are these awesome kids and we're, we're climbing under this underpass and it's like rock climbing, but it's urban and it's phenomenal and beautiful and so cool. And halfway through, like we're under this underpass, this highway underpass at like 11 o'clock on a Friday night or something like that. And these climbers are fantastic. They're all like, you know, 20, 21, 22 in their peak doing really complex, crazy climbs. And we're shooting this and these two drug dealers who are like just whacked out of their mind, come up to us. And they're like, yo, like, what's happening? Like, what are you guys doing? And like, yeah, we're rock climbing. And the guy's like, what, no way. Like, you can't climb that, no way. And he goes like, I will like, I will like give you this bag of weed if you can do it. And the guy like did it. He's like, oh, I was like, oh my God. And he's like, here's, here's your weed. He's like, and this one buddy's like, I'm freaking out. Are you guys marionettes? Are you guys, tell me right now. Are you guys marionettes? Are there strings? Are there strings? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, no, no, we're not strange, man. We're like climbers. The guy's like, oh, you guys are like so sick. We're just going to like sit over here and watch a bit. We're like, all right. And these guys sat there just with their pupils, like taking up half <laughs> their faces. And it was this crazy scene. And like, we had it in the edit. Um, and then we're like, you know what? This is too, like, this is too bonkers. Like, this is too mm. bonkers. And it's going to take away from kind of the beauty of the scene. So we, we, we sadly cut that out. And uh, Ryan and Mark, the guys that, that shot it, were like, they're still mad at me for cutting that out. Because it was just <laughs> this surreal, like, this surreal thing that's happening with these guys. And, you know, only 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 in Montreal under an underpass at like 11 o'clock. But, <laughs> oh so that's that's an example. And, and, and also in, in every, in every, in most of the cities we visited, like there were only so many wildlife encounters that you could put in because it takes time to flush out those scenes. So there were a couple that I that I ended up uh, sadly having to cut out. But maybe they'll, they'll maybe they'll make an appearance on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> that was probably the best trip that those guys oh. have had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Is this exactly. real? Is, is this, this real? real? Is this happening? I was like, there are strings. I know there are strings. Like, you guys are marionettes. <laughs> It's incredible, especially after watching that scene. That is, yeah, that is like another mm -hmm. layer of just hilarity and awesomeness. <laughs> but I can also understand why you would take that out. But still, yeah, yeah, that yeah, is. Yeah. I'm glad you shared that because that just made that scene even better. Just right. that. Awesome. Well, there's a, there's um there was a scene there was a scene sort of similar, not like not that crazy, but in the Vancouver episode, these crows are not so nice to an old lady, and um, <laughs> that's. <laughs> you reversed yeah you saw yeah it was like it was such it was such a funny we kept it in it was such it was it, like but it, we kept it in and like as i'm as i'm seeing this happening when i real when we all realize what's happening we're like oh my god i can't believe this is happening and i can't believe we're rolling on this like it, it's just it was it was so bizarre and i felt so bad for anyway just watch yeah episode one they'll see how this yeah what these crows do yeah, to the old lady yes, <laughs> But, yeah, it's a very entertaining series. So I would like to take a moment to go back to you, you know, and talking about, I mean, you've said so many incredible things. You've done all these documentaries, you know, you started your own production company, all these things. And I think now maybe it's just because of my age and maybe all my life experiences or maybe where all of us are at in our lives. I... It seems that to do this, it's also hard to juggle having a family and so i wanted to ask you how do you find personally in your life how have you been able to balance that has uh, after you got married and had a kid like did you switch what you do have you found ways to balance that or um because most of us are in the field in some way shape or form and i think a lot of us hold off having a family and so i'm trying to maybe i guess give a little bit more inspiration that you can do both mm. and so how have you found how to juggle both I think the reason that I can do any of this and like, it's the reason I can. And the reason I do do this is my wife is awesome in every way. And she's, she's a traveler. Like she gets it. Mm. Like she's, she's, she's an adventurer herself and she knows like, you know, she knows what it means to be called, right. To, to, to have this desire to go out and see the world and, and, and do these things. And, uh, we have, we have a six year old and I want to be a good dad. Like I don't, I don't want to be absent and to make all of this work. I've had to be, find how to be extremely efficient. And mm -hmm. I've never been, since my son was born, I've never, like never in my life have I been this focused in like, we go, we get, we come home, which is how you should do every production but you know that came to me through wanting to be home for him. and and when i'm home i it's not always possible but i just try to be super present and like with with my family and and here and like try to be a good dad and try to be a good husband and give you know well after i'm fit on the road for a couple of weeks come back and be like hey babe like go away <laughs> you know I've, I've got our little guy just like go do something like yeah i try like it's, it's not always possible but i but i try to to find that balance and i think one of the worst things that you could do is be dishonest with yourself or with your your partner because it sucks it like it can really suck it can suck when you're when you're away and you're missing stuff at home it can be terrible for them because you're away and it's it's hard and your kid misses you or your, your wife misses you and the worst that you can do is be like, oh, yeah, it won't be so bad. You know, whatever, I'll be back. It's like, no, 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 it will, it will be bad. Let's find ways to to mitigate that. And communication is key and honesty is key. And it's also helped me too because now I'm like even more selective with what I do with projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I get, I, I I do some freelance directing gigs and, you know, if people call me, hey, you know, I've got this, got this thing. And I'm like, eh. Yeah, like I could, I could, you know, sure, I could use the money, but like, or whatever, this is kind of cool. But like, is it worth, like, is is the money and, and, and the project worth leaving this for a couple of weeks? I don't, I don't think so. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And when I, when I am home, just making sure that, like, there's a good balance too, and my wife can do what she uh, loves and wants to do and, and, and have a life. And so, yeah, just a lot of being just super honest with how hard it it can be and 
I, I think if this is a life that you're going to choose and you're for anybody, if you're going to have, um, it's, it's hard, it's hard to do without a partner that, you know, they don't have to be doing the same thing that you're doing, but I think they have to understand and appreciate it. And those honest conversations early on are awesome. Like, <laughs> if you, you know, if you're on a dating app, maybe put the, you like, <laughs> you're, you're kind of secondary to my travel, you know, like I travel, yeah. you know, you know, those are, those are, those are big, those are big things. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's the balance. And like, there's no way, there's no way to romanticize any of that. It's really hard. It's hard. Like it's also, I mean, you, I, I, anyone who's doing this knows who's listening. Like this isn't an area like conservation or environmental storytelling isn't like flush with cash. Nobody gets, nobody gets uber rich doing this. You'll do okay. But the payoff is you get to lead a fascinating, interesting life with, with passion. And um, I feel, I mean, I feel like I've won the jackpot, you know, won the lottery that I have a, a partner that I can, I can do that with and, and it, and it, and it works. And those that sort of all that stuff melded together has made me feel um, extremely lucky. But yeah, I think just the really short answer to your question is just like, be honest about, about how tough it can be. Mm -hmm. Open communication. It's amazing oh, yeah. what that can do. It's such from day one. Eh? I like I like that you threw that in there. First date, be like, yo, okay. So we're just gonna get this out right now. <laughs> like I leave a lot. So a lot. if you're not yeah. cool with that, then yeah. like I'm just gonna pay my tab and we're gonna go. So like yeah. just like filter it out. <laughs> it's 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 every it's every like it's it's yeah, that, the sooner you get the stuff out of the like with with everything, like especially yes. at especially at this age, we're not in high school anymore. Just no, just be honest, lay it all out, like <laughs> yes. you know. We know who we are. Like we know exactly. This exactly. is what I do. This is if you're it. not on par with that, that is a okay. But you're not the person for me. Yeah, so yeah, no, yeah, that's yeah, great yeah. advice. Yeah. That is great advice. So next, then. You've been doing this for a while and you've covered so many stories and have met so many people. Like, what's your hope for the future? For myself or for the planet? What do you mean? Both. Hope, like, both. Oh my God, we're going to be here for a while. Um, For myself, I want to, I want to get better at what I do. I want to get better at the storytelling that I do. I want to be more engaging. I want to challenge myself. I sort of know the safe stories that I can do, you know, the... I could, I could, I could generally hit a couple doubles, right? Like I can get on second base. That's fine, right? Everybody likes a second base hitter, but I want to, I want to really hone what I do and, and make the stories like phenomenal. I want to give myself every reason to not do a story before I set foot out of the door. And I just want to get better and bolder with my storytelling. I've been really aggressively uh, getting up my credentials and skills in scuba diving and oh, my next little round of storytelling is going to be very scuba focused and i think i'm taking what i've done up here uh in this nice breathable air I'm, I'm taking a lot of that under the water and under the ice uh for that matter and there's going to be some very i hope anyway some some, some cool stuff i'll be able to share with people over the next year or so about what's what's happening to our to our waters like right right here like most most cities are you know have some have some water and uh and we, we build that's what that's what civilizations do they've, they've built along the water and i'm really excited to take my storytelling under there and in terms of like just a global thing i'm not a i'm not a biologist i'm not a i'm not a scientist i'm not i'm not somebody who can um you know, make, I think, make grand predictions on what's going to happen. But I do, I do know people and I do talk to a lot of people as, as part of my job. And it seems like as we have flooding kind of like, it just seems like it's just like this daily occurrence in cities, some city somewhere is flooded. Uh, now you know the the big trend is is us from Canada sending everybody down to the states our, our smoke from our our wildfires, and <laughs> yes. we're in really in the last couple of years like climate change has become a part of our daily life, and what my what my hope is is that we don't become complacent about that, where we're like whoa 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 like this this is like this is weird and this is bad, 
And this is like, we can't do anything. Like we, we can't live our lives like this. You know, I'm not going to lie. When I saw, when I looked out a couple, well, when those forest fires were sort of raging at the peak of that, I sort of looked, looked outside and the sun was like just this little orange bowl and it looked like this apocalyptic hellscape. I smiled for a minute and I'm like, maybe, maybe this is it. Like maybe this is the thing where people are like, enough, no more subsidies for oil and gas. We got to stop these stupid logging practices that we have. We've got to be the way that we were aggressive about COVID you know, especially in that, that early time, that's what we need to do with climate change, like wartime measures, because that's, that's really what it is. So I don't know, my, my hope for, for right now, for the future is what we've been seeing really in, in our continent in the last, you're not even talking about like the rest of the world and the global South, but what we've been seeing in, in Canada and the States in the last couple of years specifically, it's like, let's say, let's go. Like, this is enough. It's time. It's time to like put the brakes on, make some serious sacrifices. So we could, we could go outside at the least. Right. And that's, yeah, that's, that's maybe, maybe less of a prediction, more of a, me just being optimistic. Yeah. Well, we have to be, I like to call myself a realistic optimist. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Love it. I will always be optimistic and super hopeful, but I'm not ignorant to the truth mm -hmm. i know mm -hmm. what's going on but sure. i will always hope for the best sure because what else do we have to live on so that's right <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah i know it's like an oxymoron it doesn't make sense but i'm like i think that's the best way to describe myself real well done. optimist i like but, that you know? i like that <laughs> yeah. i like that i like that a lot yeah. So you kind of just gave us a little bit of a hint, but could you tell us a little bit more? Maybe are you working on anything yeah, next or yeah. what is going on? So, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm really trying to partner with people that are smarter than me. And like, that's, that's what Amen. I want to do. That's, that's it. I want to work with people that are smarter than me and, and you know, ride up the coattails of people that have done some, some phenomenal work. So Right now, I'm doing a project that uh, involves uh, algae and our waters and some like people that have basically devoted their entire lives to to diving and to exploration. And I'm, I'm tying all that together to hopefully tell this really, really unique story that that hasn't been told. Not, not only has it like it hasn't been told scientifically, it hasn't been told in like. It, in video or photos or, or anything like that, it's going to impact, you know, our, our lakes. And you're in Ohio, you know what you know what winters mean. And we're losing our winters. Um, they're not. Oh, here I go. We're not like they used to be. But you know, <laughs> we're having really bad years in terms of, of ice coverage. And what's this going to mean for for our lakes and and for our cities? And all this stuff sounds really abstract and contradicts how I started talking about this podcast about being super precise. But I don't want to. I don't want to give too much too much away but it's just it's just to say i'm a winter baby i was born in december i love the ice i love the cold and i thought i liked scuba diving and i realized no i love scuba diving when it's under ice and i'm lucky enough right now to be like involved in a project that has so much to do with ice diving that not a lot of people do which is a shame because it's it's so fun and cutting a hole and going into the ice and having a foot of ice between you and and, and survival is, is is super fun and everything's working against you and even though you could be diving like with the, the skyline in the background, you know, under this ice, it's it's possibly the harshest, you know, conditions that you'll ever you'll ever face on 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 or under planet Earth. And I, I love that I can do that in cities. And I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm having, I'm excited to share this with everybody. Mm, well, you'll definitely have to keep us posted on that. Holy oh, shit, dude, that sounds incredible. Yeah, it's gonna be you'll fun. You'll have to come back on, especially if that's uh, underway and oh, you know, absolutely. whenever it's put on together. Absolutely. When you can talk more about it formally, we'll definitely yeah, have to yeah, do yeah. another episode oh, to keep good. you posted on your adventures. Well, I mean, of course, absolutely. we'll chat about your adventures, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Give everybody 100%. updates and things to go yeah. along. But on that, so how can somebody get a hold of you, follow you online, watch the series? So I'm, more drop everything. <laughs> I'm so I'm so simple. Like just find me on Instagram. I'm Andrew underscore Budziak. And like talk to me. Reach out. DM me. Like let's chat. Like I, I love chatting with people. Um if I don't go back to you right away, I'll get back to you eventually. I love communicating. And that's how I 
share what I'm doing is it's, it's all sort of through, through Instagram, like, Hey, here's what I'm up to. Like, and then my series edge of frame, it's all as of very recently available on YouTube. So it's up there for everybody to see. You can go through my YouTube account, or if you just want to go through my Instagram, all the links are there. I, I, everything I do, I try really, really, really hard to keep on the free side of things. So I have, I have a lot of documentaries out there that are like on like water bear, which is a free platform or, or YouTube and any stuff that does that they do for broadcasters or broadcast you know, outlets or, or wherever on channels. I, I try to like eventually get that stuff up online. Cause I don't want people to have to pay to, to see, to see what I'm doing. So yeah, there's tons of stuff um, on my website, uh, tons of stuff on my YouTube channel, but I think my Instagram and your underscore budget Jack is where you can like see my work, see my photos, links to all my videos and like chat with me if you're bored and you know, you're, <laughs> you're at an airport bar somewhere and uh, you had a layover and you had a couple of wrong codes. Like, hey, what's Andrew up to? Let's, let's see, let's, let's, let's hassle him. And yeah, why not? Right. Oh, that's great. And of course I'll have all of those links in the show mm -hmm. notes. So you can also go to rewildology.com, check out show notes, connect with me, connect with Andrew. We always love to chat, but Andrew, thank you for oh, taking thanks, the time bro. to sit down with me. Tell me all the behind the scenes of your beautiful series. I definitely enjoyed watching it and also just appreciate the love of urban wildlife because they need a voice too. So thank you for all of your work. I'm so glad we're able to do this. This was great. Thanks a lot. Who is feeling inspired to go out and see if beavers are near you or if you can find a raptor nest somewhere? I know I was reminiscing during this conversation about the local coyote pair that lived in the open space beside me in a densely populated area of Denver. I'd routinely see them during the day and night, both of them, going about their normal lives. If you have a story about urban wildlife, please let me know. Send me your story at hello at rewildology.com or share the story in the Rewildologist Facebook group. Again, I want to personally thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. Please consider supporting the show however you would like. They all are welcome. Whether it be by subscribing on your favorite podcast app, following the show on social media, we even just signed up for the new thread, so go meet us there, sending a donation to help keep these stories on the airwaves, or purchasing a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love to everyone you know. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. To see the Focusrite gear I use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>